Hey everyone, so week seven, lecture one, let's talk about measure development. And this is gonna tell you how to make a measurement instrument, which a lot of people do for their dissertation. So let's do it. So what is measurement? A reminder from uh, last semester, measurement is the process of assigning numbers to constructs in some sort of systematic way that reflect the properties of that construct. So we talked about how, you know, assigning pounds to the construct of weight, you're measuring weight or, or length to inches to length, you're, you're measuring length, same idea. So why is it we don't just measure things like this? Hey, here's a Likert scale one to five. How intelligent are you? One to five. Um, well, first of all, and probably most importantly, is something called multidimensionality. And that is the fact that we measure these really complex constructs in psychology and they tend to have more than one dimension so just asking person you know overall on this construct uh, where are you uh, might not work so uh, for example you know intelligence is uh, uh, made up of subscales right so you got verbal spatial nonverbal uh, sorts of abilities all are the multi dimensions behind this larger construct that we call intelligence. And so a simple one question like this isn't going to cut it. So another reason is that we lack con context. So, you know, if you, you, you were measuring how annoying people are, you think you could really just say, <laughs> how annoying are you? One to five and people uh, would actually have the context or wherewithal to know. Um, another reason is, you know, people don't actually know what constructs mean sometimes. So you can't just be like, hey, like, what's your disassociation level, one to five? Uh, it doesn't quite work. So uh, yet one more problem is they don't even know what it means. It's also a problem in psychology in particular in that people lie. You know, measuring a table doesn't lie, right? But people do. So we want to avoid those response sets like social desirability. Um, those reduce our reliability and sensitivity when you just have one item like this. Uh, it's easy to lie. Hey, I'm super smart. And also uh, you end up with low reliability because you're not measuring things uh, consistently. And uh, uh, it's a problem for your overall uh, power for your, your analysis. So in general, do not make a questionnaire that is just one item. So we need more than one item most of the time to measure the sorts of constructs we deal with in psychology. So moving on, let's talk about how you design a measurement instrument to try to measure some sort of construct. Well, step one is you gotta choose construct. So uh, generally, um, at least for the assignment in this class, pick one, <laughs> one construct and make it a simple one, like not something crazy like love. Uh, make it a simple construct that you wanna measure. Uh, it doesn't have too many dimensions to it. So um, depression, for example, uh, would be something you could probably make a questionnaire to measure, although there's plenty of good ones out there already. Um, but you wouldn't want to try to make a questionnaire that's like the psychological diagnosis questionnaire that measures, you know, all over the place in terms of psychological diagnosis. That's too broad. Pick something simple. So you have to decide what sort of sampling method you are going to use to measure your construct as your step two. So what do we mean? Well, the best sorts of measures uh, of constructs measure behaviors or attitudes associated with that construct, um, rather than just asking opinions on things. Um, so if you can come up with a way to, to measure a thing with actual uh, uh, behavior you're gonna, or attitude, you're gonna get a better measure. So what am I talking about? So let's say you wanted to measure aggressiveness. So you sure wouldn't want to say, how aggressive are you, one to five? We got that down on the last slide. but um, a good way to measure uh, aggressiveness is to measure aggressive sorts of behaviors or how people would react in situations and you're sort of de facto measuring their aggressiveness by asking them how they behave or how they react or what they do. So maybe you measure the reactions under various frustrating conditions uh, that you have items about and uh, that might be thought to trigger aggressive behaviors. You know, road rage is like an obvious one. Some guy cuts you off. How do you, uh, how do you, uh, how would you react? Um, sort of uh, questions. You're, you're asking them to be, to report behaviors, which people do a much better job of doing than sort of thoughts or feelings. So let's say you're going to measure attitudes about recycling. 
Well, you could say, you know, how do you feel about recycling? And eh, that would be bad. A better way to do it is to identify and measure attitudes about all the different factors that are associated with acceptance of recycling. So, you know, uh, uh, do you, uh, how do you, uh, do you recycle cans? Do you recycle glass? Um, do you drive an old car uh, instead of a new one? Whatever it is, tires. What do you throw out? Um, that, those sorts of things. Do you try to buy uh, do you buy things that are in biodegradable uh, containers, etc.? So to do this, to find all these dimensions that you, you want to measure for a construct, preferably get attitudes or behaviors, is uh, you do a lit review. So the easiest thing to do is don't reinvent the wheel. So sort of go out there and see, first of all, how other people measured that construct that you want to measure. And then also, what are all the sorts of important dimensions that people have identified that are associated with this, this construct that I need to measure if I want to measure the overall construct? So again, like intelligence, you can't just measure verbal ability. You'd have to measure all the different parts of it, all the different sub subparts of intelligence to measure the overall construct of intelligence. So find existing measures of the construct that are already out there and exist and see how they measure them and swipe and borrow ideas for uh, sort of what, what subconstructs they're measuring. And this is one way to ensure that you have construct validity. So remember construct validity is when, um, excuse me, content validity is when you have measured all the relevant sort of constructs behind uh, uh, or pieces or facets of a construct uh, you have some experts say, yep, you have measured them all. And so uh, the example I usually give is uh, like a, a job uh, exam or a job measure, how good people are going to be at a job. You find out what uh, skills and knowledge and abilities are required for the job and you uh, have tasks or you have items that measure all those things. And to the extent you have covered all the uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities that are necessary to be successful at the job, and you measure them, you have uh, a content valid uh, qu uh, exam or questionnaire for that job. All right, so step three, um, you got to choose the format for the measurement instrument. So, you know, uh, what are you going to do? So the most, the, are you going to do something that's written? Are you going to do something that's oral? Are you going to have them do a task, a behavioral format? Um, like written questionnaires, uh, even then, versus phone surveys, versus some sort of task analysis. So the most common, I mean, like by far uh, in psychology are ones that are self-report, written, uh, or online surveys. Particularly for dissertations, it's super duper common that people uh, use questionnaires. Sometimes you got to make your own questionnaire, which is why we're doing this assignment. So, for example, uh, surveys are written or uh, uh, self-report uh, written questionnaires, SAT exams, psychological questionnaires, most of the ones where you're circling Likert scales, you know, one to five, one to seven. Um, so what's the downside of using written or online surveys? This is a little bit of a refresher from last semester. They are susceptible to response sets. So response sets, as you recall, are uh, the tendencies of participants to respond systematically to items regardless of content. They tend to be positive or they're trying to present themselves in a socially acceptable light or they're just sort of someone who goes down the middle. Those are all those response sets we talked about. So acquiescent was the tendency for people to just agree, be very agreeable. Naysaying is the opposite of that. These are people who just, you know, in general rate things low or say, uh-uh. Uh, there's extremities, so I've done this one myself, where you tend to just sort of, like, I'm not in the middle, I either really liked it or really didn't like it. Uh, uh, Cop-out is going down the middle, so if you leave in a middle choice, you know, like an odd number, one to five, people can pick three, which is neither that way nor the other. So one of the things you got to consider when you're designing your uh, response format is, are you going to have an even number? Uh, if you're doing Likert, sorry, are you going to have an even number or odd number? If you have an even number, it takes away their ability to sort of go down the middle and do cop out. So uh, we tend to use these techniques like negatively worded items or lie scales. These are things we talked about last semester to sort of identify when people are giving us garbage data. So negatively worded items are, you know, you, you've got a self-esteem questionnaire, for example, and most of the items are like, I feel pretty good about myself. I accomplish things. I can set out and, and, and do anything I need to. That th Those are positively worded, meaning a higher score means more of the construct. 
negatively worded is you throw in a couple that are the opposite. I never do anything of any that's any good. Um, I, uh, I don't really like myself. You throw a couple of those in there just to see if they're you know going high on all responses or low on all responses because you wouldn't expect that sort of pattern if people are responding honestly. And light scales, uh, if you recall, are questions you can put on there that uh, uh, are trying to pick up on people who are uh, lying to look good or lying to look bad. So there's uh, items, the MMPI's got a bunch of them, for example, uh, that are used to detect people who are trying to fake good, fake bad, etc. There are items that, uh, you know, almost no one sort of uh, uh, tends to do that cluster of items as extremity, extremities, for example. So next step is, well, you need to create items. So let's say you know you decided you're going to do a, a written questionnaire like most people do for their dissertation. You've got to write items. So where do you get the content or ideas for writing items? Well, this is where I was saying um, you go to the literature. So you go look at other questionnaires that are out there and you go to the literature and see what sorts of factors have been identified by the research as important for measuring your construct. So let's say you wanted to measure likelihood of success in college. So the SAT measures more than just verbal ability, right? It's got the quantitative scale, the analytic scale, or had it, it used to anyway, and the writing ability scale. So you gotta make sure uh, if you wanted to measure likelihood of success in college, you didn't just get verbal, you gotta get all these different facets, the quantitative, the analytical, the writing, and the verbal, because all those are important for your success. So. Go out to the literature, identify what the constructs uh, are that are important for uh, a particular measure. And um, you need to then sort of uh, make items that cover all those facets. So if, if it's been identified as something that's important for say leadership is uh, you know listening ability, you need to make sure that you've got an item about listening ability. If it's uh, ability to give instructions, then you need to have an item that's uh, also about ability to give instructions. You want to identify what are all the different sort of pieces that are important for capturing the overall construct and write items for them all. You need to choose a response format uh, for your items. So most commonly we use Likert scales, but uh, you could do oral responses. You could do some sort of a behavioral task where you're observing things. I mean, I'll just be honest, you're probably going to do a written or an online one, right? And then you have to choose your format. Do you want something that is discrete? They're going to do yes, no, or check all of that apply or something like that. Or you can do open-ended, which I don't recommend. Um, or are you going to do the most common type, which is a Likert rate scales? And that's the, you know, one to five with anchor points on there uh, from not at all to all the time, that sort of thing. But you do have to pick, are you going to use an interval that is odd um, or an interval that's even, even? So one to five or one to six. And as I mentioned earlier, if you do an odd uh, interval, they tend to be the most common, to be honest. Um, you do leave that middle point, like one to five, they can pick three all the way through. Um, you probably end up having to throw their data out because they're copping out. You got to pick your anchor points. So, uh, uh, you know, is it going to be strongly discreet to strongly agree, very unhappy to very happy, um, um, never to always, that sort of things. So you got to pick your anchor points that you want to use. My recommendation is if at all possible, use the same anchor points for all your items. Um, I mean, you, you want to make it easy for your participants. You, uh, uh, one, one of the things we see on dissertations online in particular uh, is that if you make things too much of a pain, you get a lot of, of uh, dropouts, which we called mortality last semester. A lot of people dropping out and your response rate goes down. And remember, you got to hit at least a 50% response rate to um, feel uh, have, have any sort of faith in your results, but you captured a good sample. So what are some other considerations for creating your self-report surveys after you uh, pick your format, pick your type, write your questions, get your anchor points, get uh, how you're going to collect responses? Well. You want to write your, your items clearly and concisely, um, if at all possible to put things in the stem that is the lead into a thing. How often do you, boof, that's what we call the stem. Um, one common mistake when you're first writing these things is, is to have uh, uh, something that could be in the stem in each of the items, right? So 
uh, like they all start with at school um, <laughs> or I always that sort of thing if you can put it in the stem so there's less for them to read it's um, you're gonna get higher response rates you're gonna make a better questionnaire so that's one way to be clear and concise keep it your presentation consistent at, if at all possible so you know you, you don't want Sometimes the one of five is on the right side of the page. Sometimes it's on the left. You want to keep things aligned, easy to read. You want to encourage them to actually finish your questionnaire. And uh, so you get your data so you can you can graduate. Right. So most items, please do this, uh, should be positively worded. And again, that means that when people rate the item higher or say yes to the item or whatever it is, it means more of the underlying construct that you're trying to measure, not less. Like I cannot tell you how awful and confusing it is for committee members and I, and uh, your participants if you know you, you're measuring aggressiveness and a higher score means less aggr uh, less aggressive. That's just crazy. Don't do that. Higher score more the thing you're measuring. So what do we do with those negatively worded items? If we do include them, we recode them before we add up someone's total score. So you, it is a good practice to include a couple negatively worded items. And for those, that means a higher response is less of the construct. So again, if you're measuring uh, aggressiveness, um, most of your items are going to be about, uh, you know, one to five scale from never to always. I, I sometimes get angry for no reason. I get, uh, I get upset if someone cuts me off in traffic. Like you, most of them are going to be like that where a higher score is more aggressiveness, but you want to throw in the occasional and I don't really know the sort of optimum ratio for this, but at least a couple where um, I'm a generally ge generally a pretty calm person in the face of conflict. Um, that would be a negatively worded one where a higher score is less aggressive, right? And um, what, what we do, and I'll teach you this later in the semester, is we flip those, uh, we put them in SPSS and we actually flip around the responses. We recode them so that a, a five is a one and a four is a two, three stays is three. Uh, two is four and one is five. We actually flip them in SPSS before we sum up all the responses to the items to get a total score so that still we end up with higher scores more of the underlying construct. So again, negatively worded items are good for being able to identify people who are giving you garbage data, using a response set, etc. And again, we recode them. So you need to also determine, um, and you will have to do this uh, uh, here as well, how your total scores are calculated. So you want it to be pretty clear and concise. Like do we uh, 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 just sum up the responses to the item after we recode any negatively worded ones? Do we uh, take the average response that they gave to your 10 items? Like what, what sort of, uh, how are total scores calculated? And what do they mean? And again, higher scores, more of the construct is absolutely the way to go for uh, any anything you make of this. You know, um, a bill, uh, willingness to own pets, a higher score meaning less would be so confusing. Don't do that. Those are the worst dissertations to be on. You're sitting there trying, like they're talking to you, and you're spending all this time sort of flipping it around in your head to try to make sense of what folks are saying. So please don't do that. Higher score, more of the construct. So summing all the responses to the items after reverse codings versus taking the average response. Those are two common ways uh, in psychology that we use to make total scores, meaning the, uh, the total score across the entire measurement instrument. Um, you want to be able to say what total scores mean. So, uh, you know, uh, the best practice, again, is to have higher is more of a construct. So, uh, for example, you want to be able to uh, write the sentence for your method section uh, that says total scores uh, for life satisfaction are created by summing their uh, participants responses to all 15 items uh, with higher scores indicating more uh, or better higher life satisfaction. So you need uh, some instructions at the top of your questionnaires that you make that just briefly do not overload them with instructions either again less is more in general. Um, please read each of the following and respond using the one to five Likert scale from agree to, to totally dis or, sorry totally disagree to agree. So let's go through one. This is the first uh, questionnaire I ever made in my life, so you guys get to go on this journey with me. I was an undergrad, 
um, I needed to choose a construct and the construct that I chose was support for abortion. So uh, it was an attitude measure of how much they support abortion. So how am I going to measure this? Well, my sampling method uh, was sort of chosen for me by the fact that I had to use the people in class. Um, so I, I knew that uh, it was, was going to end up being a written questionnaire. And so how am I going to capture all the content that's related or important for understanding how someone feels or supports abortion? Um, I needed to identify all the known factors that were associated with people's different levels of support for abortion. So um, I went to the literature and sort of looked out there what things are correlated with uh, support or not support for abortion. I looked at other scales about abortion supports uh, that existed and I swiped uh, ideas from them. You know, you, you learn quickly. Uh, uh, it matters to some people if, uh, uh, you know, birth control was used, uh, but the person still got pregnant or if um, uh, the, the baby would be born into poverty or not. You sort of ask these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, if, if the, for any reason, uh, didn't didn't like the sex of the of the the baby etc. You uh, write items for all these different questions. So here is what I initially came up with back in the day, um, as the factors or facets that uh, I needed to write items for in order to to sort of fully measure how uh, how much someone supports abortion or not. So the mother's health, uh, you know, uh, would you support? an abortion uh, if it was a dangerous to the mother's health, uh, if um, the, the person was still in school, uh, if they just didn't want that sex of child for any reason. These are sort of all the different facets that I needed to uh, write items for. So what format? Again, selected for me already. It was going to be self-report uh, in class, uh, but for your dissertation, it might be an online survey. It's not a problem. The university doesn't use SurveyMonkey, but they do have a, uh, a, a, a online survey um, program that you can make surveys in, and it will dump your data right into an SPSS readable format. Um, name escapes me at this point, but I know it's out there, and it's free for you to use for your dissertation, so um, don't hesitate to ask your chair. So next step was, well, I know I got to ask, uh, I got all these different facets that are associated and I was going to use a Likert scale. Um, now I need to, to write items for all of the different facets to make sure I uh, captured them all with my questionnaire. So here they are. Um, uh, the mother's health at risk, the fetus has serious health problems, mother's unmarried and single, et cetera, and so forth. These are all the conditions and facets that uh, were identified in the literature back in the day as important for um, uh, measuring someone's sort of overall support for abortion. And so these are the items that I wrote. Uh, a couple did not use birth control, a couple did use birth control, et cetera. So then it was, what's my response format? Well, I used a one to five point Likert scale rating there are she blows from uh, against to support. Note my instructions up top. Rate the degree to which you would support a woman having an abortion under each of the following circumstances. Mother's health at risk. And you can see everything's lined up neat and clean. Uh, one to five with one being against and five for support. And um, the items just kind of continued. I don't remember exactly how many I had, but you, I think you get the idea. These were my items, and now I have added my one to five point Likert uh, response format. So my final measurement instrument in reality, I actually dug it out uh, for uh, creating this lecture. This, it was called the abortion attitude scale. Um, and I guess my instructions were a little different. Please circle the number below to rate the degree to which, God, that's wordy, you would support or be against a woman having an abortion under each of the following circumstances. Circle only one number for each statement. Like if I wrote this now, I would cut, cut, cut as many words as humanly possible out of there. Another thing I don't like on here is control drops to a second line. See that? There's probably enough room I could have popped it up. But this is just the first seven of however many were on there. And so um, this was the uh, uh, support for abortion attitude scale I use for my little correlational study as an undergrad. All right, so 
Um, finally, just I'd be remiss if I didn't do the professor thing and let you know that uh, uh, if you plan on actually using your instrument widely um, and your dissertation is widely, I would argue, um, there would be additional steps you'd want to try to cover. Um, step six would be to have uh, experts look at your items and see if you indeed uh, have content validity. You've covered the entire breadth of things that are important to measure for measuring your construct. So if not, add some items or maybe they tell you you've got um, delete some items. You want to do what we call test and item analysis. Uh, you uh, pilot your questionnaire and get some responses and see uh, how well the items sort of move together. Uh, do are there items that don't seem to go uh, with the others? We call that negative item total correlation. I'm going to teach you how to do that in a couple of weeks, um, etc. Look at uh, whether there's items that everyone answers one, so it's not really measuring anything. That those are the sorts of things you would want to do uh, in your test and item analysis. So you would uh, administer it to a pilot pool of, pe of people and you would want to make changes to the items as necessary based on the results before you went full blown and actually used it for your dissertation. It's just very good practice because sometimes you think you did a good job, which is going to be the example you guys get <laughs> when we do factor analysis. Um, you think you did a good job of making a questionnaire and you realize, oh boy, you didn't. You do not want to have to redo your data collection for your dissertation. So good idea to do a pilot study. You want to establish the reliability of your measurement instrument. Remember, reliability is when you get consistency in scores, either over time or over different forms of the, of the questionnaire, or that the items themselves are sort of internally consistent. They seem to move together. That was the Chromebox Alpha, if you remember back in the day. Um, you want uh, precise and stable estimates. And then finally, you want to establish the validity of your measurement instrument, right? So here's what I think it's measuring. One way to do that is with content validity. That's up in number six there. Um, but also do, do scores on my questionnaire that measures uh, life satisfaction correlate positively with scores on another existing measure of life satisfaction. So that'd be concurrent validity, right? So uh, that's another way to establish you are indeed measuring what you think you're measuring, which or intended to measure, which is the definition of validity. So because uh, we're only doing this for a class assignment, you don't need to do steps six through nine. <laughs> that would be awful um, for uh, this course assignment, but um, so we won't be doing them. But you know, for your dissertation, you would actually want to go through some of these steps uh, to try to establish validity, try to do some test and item analysis. It's good practice, and it's it's sort of the only way you know you measured what you intended to measure is is uh, by doing a little bit more work. Don't just don't ever use just one question. It's another thing just to emphasize. So, um, hopefully, this gives you an idea. I will. Uh, I think I'm going to post a couple examples of uh, what some students have created in the past, just to give you a feel. Um, since I'm not around, uh, since we're not around this week. So uh, you can see sort of uh, what the expectation is, but have fun. Come up with something that maybe you, you will want to measure for your dissertation and give it a shot. I mean, this is, uh, if, you, if you give it the old college try, you'll get credit for this. Um, so why not uh, get a move ahead on your dissertation in the future and try to make a, uh, a scale that measures a variable that is of interest to you that you don't think there's an existing scale out there to do. All right, good luck.